we're going to have some fun over the next few minutes pressing into a subject that, quite frankly, uh, most churches would not press into. Um, but that's the thing I love about God and I love about our church. God's okay with us asking questions that make us uncomfortable. God would rather have us ask the questions and honestly process it with him than he would to have us come to church and smile and pretend everything is okay when we have these doubts on the inside. So, you know, let me, let me share with you a story. King David was the most beloved king of ancient Israel. And one day, this is what he said to God. He said, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Night and day I cry out to you and I don't hear anything. Now God's response to that was this. Hey David, you're my guy. I need somebody like you to write that down because I'm going to put it in the Bible so people can understand how transparent and open I want people to be with me. So we figure it like this. If God's okay with us asking those questions, then as a church, we're okay with that too. So you on board with that? Excuse me. So today we're going to press into some of those sort of awkward sounding questions. And, and um, we're in this series called Who Needs God? By the way, <coughs> who would ever thought that you would come to church and the church would teach a passage um, a series called Who Needs God? And I'm going to need some water. <coughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll see if I can make this till they get here. So let's jump into this. Who needs God? The first thing is this. No matter what you believe about God, it's going to lead us to some unsettling realities. If we go all the way out here on this end of the faith spectrum, we'll have atheism. These are people who don't believe in any form of a God. Kevin did a masterful job last week laying out for us what atheism actually believes. Thank you, Froster. Hopefully that will help. <clears throat> So, if you can put your mind on what I'm trying to say, instead of whether I'm going to make it, I think we'll do okay, all right? <laughs> I am going to make it, all right? So, no matter what we believe about God, way out here on this end, this is what the leading atheists in our world say today. And as Kevin said yesterday, if you're, I mean last week, if you're walking away from something, you, have to, you actually should look at what you're walking toward. I think of it like this. If you're going to jump out of a boat, you should probably look at what you're jumping into, right? Yeah. So let's take a look at, at what atheists are saying. And that is, if you're going to buy into pure atheism, you have to believe that there's only the illusion of a mind. You don't have a spirit. You don't really have a soul. You're a collection of molecules that somehow um, sort of randomly came together and formed into a person, and you're basically just an ongoing chemical reaction between those molecules and those cells. There's there, therefore, then, the illusion of free will. You can't actually decide what you're going to do because, after all, you're a collection of random molecules that, that have already decided what you are going to do, and everything has been determined for you. There's also the illusion of value. You know, the molecules that came together and formed you just as well could have formed a rock. So you and a rock have basically the same value. And any value that you have is value that you have assumed and taken on yourself, or it's value that other people have assigned you. But you don't have any intrinsic value as a person because you're just a collection of molecules. And last of all, there's no such thing as morality because if it was all an accident that happened somewhere in the cosmos. There is no real right or wrong. So morality is simply the word that we choose to put on our preferred behavior for other people. Got it? Now, think with me for a minute. 
If you lived in a world where everyone believed that, would that be a scary place? Yeah. That's very unsettling. But in all fairness, if we move all the way to the other end of the faith spectrum, let's take a look at Christianity, because Christianity also has some things about it that are a little bit unsettling. For instance, Christianity teaches us that you need to have a relationship, one where you talk and one where you listen and one where you process. You need to have a relationship with an invisible God. Is that odd? Frankly, if it was anybody but God, we would say you're psychotic. Yeah, and yet we teach that as normal. Secondly, paradoxical truths. Most of what Jesus taught us doesn't seem natural to us. Jesus said, the way to find your life is to give it away. Huh. The way to go to the top is to actually serve everybody. If someone hits you on the right cheek, what are you supposed to do? Turn the other one. Are you kidding me? Is any of those natural to you? None of them is natural to me. So when I look at that, I think, huh, there's some stuff there that might be unsettling. Let's go to this last, uh, the next one, non-negotiable um, morality. We are Americans, right? We don't like to buy into anything we don't get to vote on, right? Yeah. And Christianity says, no, you don't get to vote on morality. God decides morality. And, and there's a lot of times we push back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't get a say in this. Yeah, that can be hard to swallow. And last of all, injustice for all. There's something on the inside of all of us that isn't satisfied until justice is served. Does it ever bother you when people get away with stuff? Yeah. It bothers me too, but it never bothers me when I get away with it. Never. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have a whole sermon coming up on injustice for all. So I don't want to dig into that too deeply. But there's a one word Bible word for injustice for all. It's called grace. And we're going to dig into that because it's one of the key tenets of the God who created the heavens and the earth. And it's one that we struggle actually to get a handle on. So could you agree with me that there are some unsettling realities about all of this that make it not quite natural for us? And if you're not a Christian, it might even seem a little weird. That's okay. As Pastor Kevin said to us last week, let's at least understand that unsettling is not actually a valid test for truth. There are many truths that we live with day after day that are unsettling, but they're still true. Okay? But, but for all of us, no matter what you believe about God, you're going to land up in a place that has some unsettling realities about it. So what about something else? Maybe something, well, I'm not really a pure atheist and I'm not really a pure Christian. I'm sort of somewhere in the middle. Uh, I, I'm not ready to sign off on there is no God, but I'm really not ready to jump into that Christian God because I've heard about that Christian God and there's a lot of things about him that I don't actually like. So let's take a look at who that might be. And I call this the God of the No Testament because... In your Bible, there's the Old Testament and New Testament. Those are the two big divisions. And actually, this God is not in either one of those. And the strange thing about it is, much of this, many of us learned in church. Does that seem odd? Yeah. That, you, that you and I would be taught about a God that doesn't actually exist? So, for instance, many people who are in my profession, they're pastors, they're priests, they're their religious teachers, their rabbis, their rectors, whatever you might call us, that many times have used fear and guilt to flat out manipulate people. And you know what they said? That's how God wants it. And they did it in the name of God. Hmm. And that began to shape our narrative about what God might be like. Demanding. God wants it all, and don't you hold out on him, because in the end, he's going to get it. He is large and in charge, right? And the deal is, if you don't comply, you're going to fry. 
I should have gone into marketing for legalism, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember hearing those messages. Yes, that God is demanding and that God is condemning. You know, after all, God is perfect and you're not. So no matter what you do, it's never going to be good enough to actually make him happy. We'll press into that a little bit more later. And I know a bunch of you, I know your parents said this to you because you've told it to me. And then as you grew up in a church that was no fun to go to, it was boring as all get out. It might have been to me demanding. It might have been condemning. There was plenty of fear and plenty of guilt to go around. And your parents said to you, by golly, my parents made me do this. And if I had to do this, you're going to do this because this is what we do in our family. Yeah. It's more about tradition than it is about truth. This is just how we do it. That's pretty unsettling. So kind of no matter where you end up in the faith spectrum, you have to figure out that none of it is going to be just natural and easy. And oh, by the way, if it was, everybody would be doing it, right? Yeah. But you also have to realize that everything that's valuable in life takes effort and work, and that's what makes it rewarding. Here's the truth. Most of the gods that you and I have come across in our lifetime, we actually need to reject. All that stuff, most of it we need to reject because it doesn't match with truth. And this is a point at which Richard Dawkins, who is one of the the most renowned atheists in our world today, this is a point at which he and I absolutely agree. He said, we are actually all atheists about most of the gods humanity has ever believed in. And we should. We should not believe in them. It's just that some of us go one God further, and that's where I would disagree with him. But much of what we have learned... By the way, you ever ask yourself, where did you get this stuff? I said a while ago, you might have learned it at church, but your narrative about God and my narrative about God and some of the assumptions we make about God, they come from television shows. They come from something the teacher said in the school. They come from the gossip mill. They come from a neighbor who's actually mad at God and therefore says things about him that aren't true, but they seem true to that particular person. They come from parents who grew up in a certain religious environment. We get this data from all these sorts of things. And the amazing thing is, so all of these points of data that we have in our mind, we are painting a picture of God. And sometimes we step back and we look at the painting that we've made from all these data points and we go, that's ugly. And we reject God because we don't like the picture we painted of him. Hmm. So let's start with two big questions. What if God isn't who or what you think he is? I already said at the beginning, it's okay to ask uncomfortable questions here. So we're going to press into this. What if God isn't who or what we think he is? And this is where it gets even more personal. What if the God you think you're supposed to believe in doesn't really exist? Would that be sad? Yeah. If the God you think you're supposed to believe in doesn't really exist, some of you go, no, that's not sad. That's great. I'm glad because that's a God I don't want to believe in. So let's press into that. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was personally trained by Jesus, asked a crowd in the center of the ancient city of Athens, up on the Acropolis, he asked them a very similar question. He wanted them to question the narrative that they had about God and how they thought about God. Now, to give you the backstory, we've all been to cemeteries, rows of tombstones, and you walk between the tombstones and you look for the graves of those of, that you love. Well, Paul had walked through what looked like a cemetery, but it was more a garden of the gods. Okay, 
So it, it, it had all the idols that the Greek people worshipped, and some of them were big and some of them were small, and there were bunches of them because the Greeks worshipped a pantheon of gods, and so did the Romans. And so this was sort of a garden of the gods, and he was walking through there, and his eyes landed on this, on this one stone, and inscribed on the stone was this, was this inscription, to the unknown God. And Paul guessed what you and I would guess, and that is, oh, I got it. They were thinking, hmm, we got all these gods. What happens if we leave one out? Or what happens if we have left out two or three or four? So they came up with this idea, we'll, we'll do this thing to the unknown God, and they'll all think it's them, and we're good. And so Paul gets up, and he says, hey, could I get you to question how you think about God. And this is how Paul laid it out for the people. He said, now God's purpose in making the world was for the nations to seek after him. That life is really about seeking and finding God. And then he goes on to say, though he's not very far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. Some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. We are children of God. And then Paul asserts, and since this is true, and it's not in my notes, but I just want to say to those of you who are brand new, that one of the underlying messages of all of the Bible is that truth, that you and I were made to be children of God, loved by him, Dearly loved by him. And God wants to be your father. He goes on to say, we shouldn't think of God as. Do you understand? He's challenging their narratives about God. And then this was their dominant narrative. We shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold, silver, or stone. I would say to you that as a culture, we have probably grown beyond that. But there are other things about our narrative of God that we probably haven't grown out of. And I would love to say to us, we shouldn't think of God as that. And we're going to dig into what some of that is today. In her book, The Case for God, Karen Armstrong writes this. Many of us have been left stranded with an incoherent concept of God. We learned about God at about the same time we were told about Santa Claus. But while our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomenon evolved and matured, our theology remains somewhat infantile. I want to come back to that word. Not surprisingly then, when we attained intellectual maturity, many of us rejected the God we had inherited, and we simply denied that he existed. So let's take the infantile and the God that we had inherited. It's interesting that when we have an infantile understanding of God, it warps the narrative about God that we end up with. And it actually distorts to us what God looks like. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But this is the God that many of us have inherited because this is the God that is often portrayed on TV this is the God that's often portrayed in mass media. This is the God that many churches actually teach. This is the God that oftentimes we pick up from the gossip mill. This is the God we have inherited. So what was Karen Armstrong meaning when she said infantile? Let me see if I can, if I can illustrate this with a question that every parent has been asked. Where do babies come from? right? So if it's a preschool child who's asking you that question, you have already <clears throat> a prepared, wonderful two-word answer. Mommy's tummy, right? There you go. Good to go. Have you tried that answer on your teens recently? <laughs> because I'm guessing that's not going to fly. Because their understanding of where children come from needs to progress beyond the infantile stage, and it actually needs to begin to mature. So when your teen asks you, where do babies come from, you're more likely to give them the answer, well, babies are the result of sexual intimacy between dad and mom. 
To which your teens go, ew. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's an answer that they can live with. However, if you go to med school, where do babies come from? You're more likely to get this answer. Babies are the result of a union between a fertile ovum and a viable sperm. Now, did you lie to your preschool child? No. But you recognize as they grow up, their understanding also needs to mature. And when churches give people mommy's tummy answers about God, does not fly. It's overly simplified, and it simply doesn't work anymore. So, for the next few minutes... We're going to take the skin off of six different versions of God that we have inherited from various sources, and we're going to see why they don't work, okay? So let's start out with what we call bodyguard God. This is the God who never lets bad things happen to good people. Everyone in this room has struggled with this version of God. Every one of us has encountered and we have seen some very, very bad things happen to some very, very good people that we loved very, very dearly. And in our mind, we said, that should not happen. And if God were God, he would not allow that to happen. Am I right about that? We've all had that. Huh. We think we would like this understanding. And oftentimes it's given by churches that God doesn't let bad things happen to good people. I can show you lots of churches where that's taught. And, and, And so we would like this nice little theology that would be like this. If God were really God, good people would get all the wonderful breaks in life and bad people would just get broken by life until they finally figured out they're supposed to be good. Huh. But you know something? That flies in the face of the very beginning of Christianity. We should never forget that Christianity started with a very horrible thing happening to a very good person. Yeah, the sinless son of God had like the worst death ever. So we know this is a God imposter. And if that's the picture we paint of God, eventually... It will damage and destroy our faith. The second one is this. The on-demand God. Now, if you went to a church as you were growing up, and it was, um, it was a sort of very, very deeply faith-based church that believed if you had enough faith, anything could happen. Sort of a name-it-and-claim-it kind of church, or a believe-it-and-receive-it kind of church. And that God's job, if you believed enough, God's job was to supply it. And in fact, that God would give you whatever you needed or wanted unless it was overtly selfish. After all, God is for me. He just wants to make me happy, healthy, and wealthy. Hmm. Can I just say that that's actually Santa Claus theology? Let me show you what I mean. You remember 34th... uh, Miracle at 34, on 34th Street. It was a little girl, Susan, and there was Kris Kringle, who was the Santa Claus, and Kris Kringle kept saying to Susan, do you really believe in Santa Claus? Because if you really believe in Santa Claus, you will get your Christmas wish. You just have to believe. Now, we could combine that theology with the wonderful theology of another song that says he's making a list and checking it twice. And what's he going to do? He's going to find out who's what? Naughty and nice. So here's this Santa Claus theology. And that is, if you believe enough and you're good enough, God will give you what you want. Friends, that's a God imposter. That's not actually true. That's the God of the No Testament. It's not in the Bible pages. In fact, here's the truth about that. If God had granted everything you ask as a 16-year-old, many of you would be in deep trouble right now. (laughs) Isn't that true? Yeah. And you're going, 
Oh, man. I had a crush on him or her, and oh, my goodness, if I... If, and God said no, and you were, you were at the time, you go, oh, God, I don't know, I just asked it for a date. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. That's why people's faith gets damaged when we teach them that infantile picture of God. Here's the next one, the boyfriend God. This is the deal. You know, if, if, if my understanding of God is correct, that I will always feel close to him and he will always feel close to me and we'll have this wonderful relationship in which I can have complete faith in him because he always feels like he's right next to me. I read you a passage or quoted you a passage of scripture at the beginning where King David said, hey God, where are you anyway? I'm guessing he didn't feel God real close in that moment, don't you think? I've cried out to you night and day, and I'm not hearing anything from you. You see, what God has promised is this. God has promised, I will always be with you. God has never promised, you will always feel like I'm right next to you. His promise is, I'll be there when you feel it and when you don't. And the truth is that Mother Teresa and Billy Graham both spoke of whole seasons in their lives where they did not feel God close to them. Now, you want to stack up against either one of those? <laughs> Probably not, okay? And if that's how it worked for them, then that's how it's going to work for us. And for us to paint a picture of God that's anything other than that, we are setting ourselves up for massive disappointment and our faith will get damaged because boyfriend God is actually a God imposter. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not the real God. Let's talk about this one, guilt God. If you grew up in a legalistic church, I've had many of you say, well, church I grew up in, there was no shortage of guilt there. Yeah. And many of us, that might be our background. And sort of, this is the message that was sent. God loves you. He has to. He's God, right? God loves you, but he doesn't much like you. You know why? Because what you do is never enough for him anyway. You could always do more. You should always do more. After all, what does God want from you? Everything you have. How you doing? Well, I'm not quite to that level. I'm maybe not even close to that level. I'm not even in that neighborhood. So how does God feel about me? Oh, it's the sort of thing where God is going to scare you straight. So I have a couple of questions for you. Number one, how'd that work for you? Did that really scare you straight? Or did it scare you out? Probably scared you out. Yeah. Another question I would have is, are the most guilt-ridden people you know your favorite people to hang around? Not mine. No, you know what I find? <laughs> They're tired of that guilt, so guess where they try to unload it? On me. They would love for me to feel as guilt-ridden as they do. No, that was never God's design. There's nothing in the Bible that says that God continually wants his children guilty. In fact, there's everything in the Bible that God wants his children to feel the liberty of forgiveness. Sarah spoke about that this morning uh, during our time of singing. So let's go to the next God, Gap God, not to be confused with Old Navy God or Eddie Bauer God. This is Gap God, all right? This is the deal. God is the answer to everything that we can't explain or don't understand. Finish this statement for me. God works in? That's right. If you can't explain it, that's God. And that's supposed to make everybody satisfied. If something doesn't add up or you can't explain it, well, that's God. You're not supposed to. Yours is not to question why. Yours is but to do or die. So there you go. You know, some, that's not God. That God's not portrayed in Scripture. 
He's not just the convenient answer to everything we don't understand or can't explain. And in fact, what's really wrong with that is this. Gap God becomes the excuse for our ignorance rather than the motivation behind our learning, discovery, and understanding. Listen. Never, ever go to any church that tells you to check your brain at the door and just believe. Because they're selling you Kool-Aid. Don't drink it. God wants you to question. God wants you to dig in. God wants you to learn. God wants you to discover. And God wants you to have a growing understanding of life. And that sort of leads me to the last one we're going to talk about today, and that's the anti-science God. This is the sort of thinking that God can't be reconciled with science, and all you really need to do is believe. Did you know that there's no Christian in the world that I've ever met? Now, there might be a, a few weird ones out there, but none that I've ever met that actually believes that. They might say it, but they don't believe it. For instance, let's ask this question. When your child is really, really sick, where do you take them? To the doctor. So let's say you have a child that's really, really, really sick, and you take your child to the doctor, and the doctor examines your child and, you know, takes the temperature and pulse and, and blood pressure and starts asking you questions and so forth. And the doctor says to you, I don't know, I can't say for sure, but I think your child might have a very, very serious disease. And the only way I'll know is I'm going to have to take some blood and we'll run a blood test in order to confirm this. I'll let you know on Monday when the results come in. How's your weekend? <laughs> Awful. It's a weekend from hell. Yeah. Phone rings on Monday. You look at the caller ID, you recognize it's your doctor. This is the phone call you've been waiting for. You hit the green button. How's your heart rate? It's racing. Yeah, this is Dr. So-and-so. We've done the blood work on your daughter, and we think we know what's up. We think God's trying to teach you a lesson. <laughs> Is that what you wanted? I don't care about God right now. Give me some science. Because you know something? When it comes to health, Christians are all about science. All about it. Yeah. Because intuitively we know that God and science are not actually opposed to each other. In fact, here's what we intuitively know if we believe what the Bible says about God. Everything we discover in our world is actually a discovery of how God designed it to work. Now, if we believe God made this world, then everything that we discover, we recognize, is something that God put in there. Now, for you and me, who live on this side of modern science, that, that probably makes sense. But did you know that to the people who lived, let's say, prior to the Renaissance, that was not their understanding of God at all? In fact, did you know that the Christians the people that you read about in your science books were really Christian people who struggled with this thing and they actually ended up with a conclusion that became the foundation for modern science. So if you could go with me back to before modern science into a world where the, the dominant theology was that the world was governed by a system of gods and demigods that were localized and that our job was to make them happy because if we did not make them happy, then the rain would not fall and the storms might not come or maybe the storms would come and destroy everything or an earthquake would happen or whatever else. And, and so everything that happened in the world was thought to be the result of the God's somewhere out there messing with our world. Well, then guess what? When a storm came, you would never think to study the atmosphere 
Because you didn't think the storm was the result of forces in the atmosphere. You thought the storm was the result of God's somewhere being upset. So people kept looking to theology for scientific answers. And there is no, how would you like to be a scientist in that world? Where it's your best guess about what the gods are doing. But the Christians came along and they said, whoa, 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 time out. There's something in the Bible that actually sets that on its ear. In the first chapter of the Bible, where we have the story of God bringing the world into existence, regardless of how you think God brought the world into existence, at the end of that chapter, on day number seven, might be the most insightful thing of the whole chapter. Because on day number seven, the Bible says that not only did God rest, he ceased from creating. In other words, God wound up this whole world and set into place all the natural laws that govern it, and God said, I'm done doing that. I'm not going to mess with people's worlds and make all these unpredictable things happen because I'm upset today because of what somebody did. No, I've made the world. I've put people in it. And now it's going to operate by those natural laws that I put in place. And so people like Galileo and others said, if that's actually true, then everything that we see in nature should be reliable and dependable and predictable. And the more we learn about it, the more we understand how God made it to work. Now, if that's true, here's another truth. When your theology conflicts with a scientific discovery, you have a theological problem, not a scientific one. I realize that might be hard to grasp, so I'm going to illustrate it for you, okay? Let's take that guy, Galileo, who was a Christian. And Galileo invented the telescope, and he was sitting down and making all these charts, and he said one day to his fellow scientists, hey, there's a lot of evidence out there that points toward the sun being the center of of our solar system, not the earth. And you know what the church did? They kicked him out. They said, buddy, you got a theological problem. They said, you can't believe that. The earth is a special creation of God. He would never make the sun the center of of the solar system. It's the earth. This is where people live. Huh. Now, did they have a scientific problem or a theological one? They had a theological problem. Okay? And the truth is, no matter what science discovers, it will always be in harmony with God because every discovery we make is simply a discovery of how God made it to work. And when our theology conflicts with a scientific discovery, we know for sure we have a theological problem, not a scientific one. The anti-science God is a God imposter who will damage our faith or maybe even kill it. So what do we do? Well, as we close, I'm going to give you the big takeaway, okay? So I have here two packages. They look relatively alike, don't they? There's food in both of them, okay? This one is a burrito, okay? I know, I should not talk about this. At, you know, eight minutes after 12, all right? I apologize for that. This is a burrito. It's a fresh burrito. It's made out of organic, an organic tortilla shell. It's made with organic meat. It's made with organic beans, organic rice. It has organic vegetables in it. It has non-GMO cheese on it. It has non-GMO sour cream on it, 
everything in here is really good for you. This is a package of Twinkies. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Now let's just suppose for a minute that you have to choose a steady diet of one of these or the other. And let's just suppose you have been taught all of your life that you're supposed to be eating the Twinkies. You grew up in a church that served the Twinkie God, right? You turned on the TV, there's more Twinkie God, okay? And so you decide to buy in and you start eating Twinkies. You know, the interesting thing is, at first, it tastes good. Of course. At first, you think, man, that satisfies my sweet tooth. And at first, you get a buzz from all the sugar, right? You're like, whoa, this is really good. This feels really good. But you start to noticing a pattern. And then as the longer you eat the Twinkies, you get this energy thing, and then you get the Twinkie crash. And they don't actually sit that well. And you find yourself getting sick. Because the longer you sit with Twinkie God, the less fulfilling it feels. And actually you notice that your health is starting to deteriorate. And you finally say, I can't take that anymore. But over here is the actual real God. But the problem is, both packages look alike, so you know what you do? You throw the burrito out with the Twinkies, and you say, I'm done with church. I'm done with organized religion. I'm done with God. I tried that, and it simply didn't work for me. So here, my friends, is the big takeaway from the morning. Are you ready? Don't throw the burrito out with the Twinkies. Got it? Don't throw the burrito out with the Twinkies. So how does this work for each of us? Well, if you're a believer, here's what you can do this week. You can look for remnants of the New Testament gods in the God that you worship today. That should actually be capitalized, I'm sorry. Look for remnants. You know what I found out about these imposter gods? They're prevalent. They're everywhere. And they're very persistent. And when I think I have actually rid myself of all those imposter versions of God, I turn around and they are sneaking back into my life. Have any of you noticed that? Yeah. So we could do some work this week. And, and, and we can just walk through all six of those and look for remnants in our life and just process that with God. And that'll be a great week. And for those of us who are skeptics or curious, here's what you can do this week. Give yourself permission to look beyond these New Testament gods to see if there isn't a real God who's actually worth believing and following. And in the coming weeks, we're actually going to press into that God. And that we will find very refreshing. Let's pray. God, thank you, thank you, thank you. That you have all sorts of patience with us. And that we can come with doubts and questions and we can come with false news about you and bad pictures and, and, and instead of you getting angry with us, you just start to peel back the layers and, and, and you say, hey, I'll work with you in this because I actually want you to get to know me. So thank you that you have in various ways brought many of us through that the fact that we're here this morning means that we're actually searching. And that's a great thing. And you have said, if we'll search, and we'll search honestly, we'll find you. Because you're actually not very far from any of us. Would you give us a great week of searching and asking? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Have a great week.